Welcome to Sardar TV. I'm Vaishali Jain. We have the pleasure of having the Chief Information Officer of St. John's University here with us today, Joseph Tafano. Joe's been CIO of St. John's University for over a decade. He's also held a number of corporate jobs, and he's here to tell us more about trends, challenges, and issues that businesses face when it comes to IT. Joe, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So you've been Chief Information Officer of St. John's University since 2002. Tell us a little bit about your role. Well, I'll just start with some of the background. You know, the IT department has responsibility for the technology at St. John's University. So we cover both academic, administrative, and any other functions that um, we use technology at the university. Over the past 13 years, we've had a tremendous opportunity to help advance technology at St. John's. Uh, going back to 2003, which is right after we joined, we established a laptop program. And at that time, if you recall, laptops cost a lot more money than they do today. And for our student population, we wanted to make sure that our students had the best technology available for them. It, we often refer to the program as, well, the name of it is the Academic Computing Initiative, but we often talked about we wanted to level the playing field. So in 2003, when the students were returning in August, uh, we gave out over 3,000 computers. And similar to today, we had some tremendous press coverage. We were actually on, I believe it was Channel 9 or Channel 11 News at night, and there was a lot of coverage uh, about the program. At the same time, we installed and really spread out the wireless environment. And again, in 2003, that was not as commonplace as it is today. And back then, we, we installed over 400 wireless access points. And the students really took advantage of that. Today, we have over 1,500. And tell us a little bit about your role as CIO today. OK, today, we have a number of initiatives that we in the IT department are part of. And we're very proud of them. And one of the initiatives is we're constantly looking at the technology that the students are expecting. And so in that regard, we're looking at programs like iPad Pilots. We're working with different academic programs to see how a device like an iPad can add value to that program and how it's being delivered. And so that's a very exciting opportunity. Another opportunity that we're looking at is to continue to grow the, the uh, opportunities with big data and the data analytics or predictive analytics. So those are the types of programs that we're driving today. And we're also looking at you know, the different types of technology solutions that can really make a difference. So as we all know, whether it's Google Mail or Office 365 or programs like uh, WebEx, you know, similar to the GoToMeeting, those are starting to play a role in education. And that's some of the things that we're driving today, not to mention the university's overall investment in classroom technology. You know, all the new facilities, and we're upgrading all of our classrooms. We've always had uh, computers and projection and internet in our classrooms, but now we're upgrading it to lecture capture and uh, touchscreen monitors and other programs so that the students with their devices can project on the screens that are in a room so faculty members can ask each student, let us see your solution, let's see what you're doing, and all of that sharing. So we're doing a lot in those areas. Tell us a little bit about the mission of St. John's University. Yes, uh, St. John's University has an outstanding mission. You know, it's over 145 years old, founded by the Vincentian Fathers, and our mission is to serve the underserved. Many of the graduates from St. John's University are first-generation college graduates, and we're very proud of that. We have a large uh, high-need population, but we have a very large, diverse population of students. And we are extremely proud of that, that we reach so many different places in this country and in the world. And you yourself are an alumni of St. John's University. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. uh, long time ago, a double alumnus. My undergraduate and one of my graduate degrees is from St. John's, and then I have another one from somewhere else. For the first time in our history, we have a lay president, Dr. Conrado Bobby Gempesor who joined us last year. And it's really, he's driving a lot of innovation, a lot of success. And yesterday he gave an important uh, speech to our university community, uh, State of the University address. 
and he talked about how we're doing with enrollment and a number of other initiatives. And we had a uh, live audience of close to 900 uh, folks, and we also live streamed it, and it was close to 1,000 folks on live stream. So what kind of changes is he looking to make? One of the major initiatives that the president has driven since he joined us last year is to bring together the entire university community, students, faculty, administrators, and alumni to help define the strategic priorities of the university. As a result of the effort of the Strategic Priorities Working Group, we've identified four strategic priorities that we will be driving this year. First one is student success. Second one is the teaching and learning environment. Third one has to do with hiring and retaining the best and brightest of faculty, administrators, and students. And the fourth one is to establish global partnerships for the university. Any changes that he's looking to make um, as it relates to technology for the university? Absolutely. The president has, since he has joined the university, emphasized the role of technology, again, both in teaching and administration. So on the, the teaching side, He's looking at our classroom technology. He's really empowered us to help enhance our classroom technologies to meet today's uh, pedagogical needs. And so we're actively working on that right now to really upgrade a number of our classrooms. We have goals in that area that we're gonna upgrade over 25% of our classrooms um, to meet these needs. We've also looked at a number of administrative processes that we are driving forward. And again, in those processes, a key element is to use the data for decision making. And so those are some of the major technology initiatives that we're driving. You've also held corporate jobs in the past. Yes. You've worked at companies like MetLife and Prudential. Tell us about some of the biggest differences in working for a university versus working for a financial institution. Sure. Well, one of the places I'd like to start is there's a, there is a significant difference in what I would call openness. Not that there's anything wrong in the corporate sector, but in the uh, higher ed sector, academic sector, there's a lot more sharing among universities. I have other CIOs that we constantly communicate with each other, ask questions, follow up on issues, check in on problems. And so there's a lot of sharing at the CIO level and across organizations. There are organizations that bring together sharing. I'm not sure if you've heard of an organization, nonprofit, Educause, they, they do a lot of work on higher ed. They publish a lot of research, uh, listservs, uh, CIO blogs. So there's a lot of information shared that in the corporate sector, it's more separated company by company and things like that. The other thing is, uh, from a technology standpoint, similar theme, there's more openness. In a corporation, you receive your computer, your device, you do your work. Here you have faculty, students, and they really want the openness of the environment, information, information sharing, and the ability to connect anytime, anywhere. Businesses in almost all sectors are going through a fundamental shift when it comes to technology, which is presenting a unique set of challenges for CIOs. Tell us about what some of these challenges are. One of the challenges we see as CIOs is that you're moving from a service-oriented uh, operation and providing the technology, the hardware, the computers, to more of a strategic role. You're trying to help your organization, whether that be in corporate or in higher ed, you're trying to help your organization advance. And you constantly look at what your business or your institution needs and how could you help bring those solutions to the table. So I think that's really one of the biggest changes that we're seeing. CIOs get away from the bits and the bytes and buying this and buying that and really moving towards how do you help change the, the business and how do you help add to the business. Mm -hmm. So how does your role change that way? What is it that you are now contributing versus what you used to do as CIO? What's changed for you? So along those lines, one of the things that has changed is more collaboration with your colleagues. And for us at a university, that's the other administrators and also all the deans of the colleges and working with their teams and looking at what technologies they need in the academic programs, how can we provide them on the administrative side. No one wants to wait online for anything anymore. So you have to have systems and functions that can help the students, help the faculty get their job done. 
CIOs have always had the responsibility of driving improvements and process operational efficiency, but now there is more of this push for CIOs to actually be innovative and to drive the business rather than just running the business. So can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Yes, I think we all know that right now technology is everywhere, it's ubiquitous. And the expectations of everyone, you know, for again, for a university, whether it be the students, the faculty, the administrators, the students' families, you have to bring to the table solutions that provide opportunity to get things done in a very uh, effective manner. One of the areas, just, just a simple example, mm -hmm. is, you know, it's a big day when the students return in the fall, and we had that a couple of weeks ago. So particularly on a Saturday, we move in all of our new freshmen into the residence halls. It's a trying process for the students and the family. So one of the things we did is we developed a system, I like to call it easy pass or fast check-in. And so once the student has all their information recorded online, they can get a paper, right now we're doing it with a paper, that gets them right through the process. So when they show up, we know everything is ready. They go right to the residence hall. They get their key and they go to their room. And it's hard enough moving in all the furniture and everything else. But this is something that we did to really expedite the check-in process. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of the smaller examples. You know, we have many others like that. What are some of the challenges that you face in adapting to a more tech-savvy workforce and also a young student body who's grown up using technology? Well. Two aspects to that, I think. Number one, the expectations are, at least today, higher than they've ever been. So as we talked about earlier about wireless, you know, that's an expectation. That's no longer a benefit. Even when you think about the laptops, you know, so many students have laptops, but yet you want to make sure they have the tools to be successful. I mean, that's what St. John's is about. What can we do to help the students be successful? And so those expectations are greater than ever. The other thing is we also touched on a little bit is the uh, administrative functions that the student has to go through, whether it's registration or any of those functions, paying their bills, you have to do that in a real-time environment. You know, we've been doing it for a number of years with registration. The students, you know, when it's registration time, by class, the students are given access online, and they go in and select their classes and things like that. No more uh, paper cards or anything. I mean, we've eliminated so much paper for the, the student life, and it really is, it's important. And I think we've done a great job, but as I said earlier, it's expected. It's no longer a benefit. So you have to keep looking at what the next benefits are. And you know, everyone is now carrying around a phone, right? And as you see that, you see at airports, you know, you just walk up and you show your phone. Well, we're looking at how else we can do that. So for our accepted students day, we sent out their code. When they show up to register for the event to be, you know, for the first accepted students day, they just hold their phone up, it scans, and they're in. And the use of big data has also become an issue for almost all organizations. How are you processing and filtering data to make decisions as CIO of St. John's? And are you able to capitalize on the growth of big data as CIO? Absolutely. Um, really, one of our most recent activities around big data is to use the data to help what we call shape the incoming class. So we wanted to recruit the best students that we strive to have at St. John's. St. John's has a very strong mission of serving the underserved. And in doing that, we want to make sure, we want to do the best we can to bring students in that deserve a good education and really will do well at St. John's. And so we looked at the data from previous years and we had a number of people working on it and we came up with better approaches to where we were going to try to recruit the students, how we were going to attract the students. And we now have a class that's one of the largest freshman classes that we've had in, I think it's four years. We also uh, record all the data so that we can see all of the activities of the students and help them with their programs. Uh, all of our advisors have access and it really makes a big difference. What do you think are some of the ramifications for the organization if IT cannot go from being tactical to more strategic and bottom line focused? 
there are a number of ramifications. Let's take some of the straightforward ones. On the administrative side, students would be utilizing processes that maybe were developed, you know, 10 years ago. So if you're not looking at the technology and understanding and driving how you can use that effectively, your processes are going to be, unfortunately, old-fashioned. On the academic side, it's even more dramatic because many of the pedagogical uh, functions in the classroom are changing. You know, now there are flipped classrooms, active learning classrooms. So much of the work is done outside the class today. And you have to provide the tools to make that valuable. You have to provide the tools that support whether it's learning or testing or sharing of information. You know, tremendous amount of collaboration among students and faculty outside of the classroom. Then there's even a third layer that we see is very important. Each of the programs have technologies that help drive them. One easy example to understand is if you think about a business school, you have to have what many people refer to as a financial lab, where the students have access to Bloomberg terminals. They have access to the financial tickers. And that's incorporated into their learning. So when they graduate St. John's, they walk into Wall Street or they walk into a financial institution. They've worked with this stuff. And that's across all your programs. That's definitely prominent in pharmacy, in our science programs, definitely in the education programs. And one of our colleges, uh, the name of it is called the College of Professional Studies. There are programs in computer science, homeland security, hotel management, programs like that. Well, you have to be familiar with these tools or, you know, as you're saying, what would be the ramifications? Students coming from another institution will be. And so you really want to make sure, and we have a number of programs where we're ad addressing those. We constantly address them, but we're uh, remodeling and we're rebuilding our business school building. And you know, it's going to have all of the latest technology. Same thing for the College of Professional Studies, where they're housed. We're adding a number of labs that will support computer science, homeland security, the ever popular and famous cybersecurity. Uh, we have all of these programs, and technology plays a role. You know, it doesn't get away from what the teacher does and the teaching, but it's really good to have the tools that help it. And many leaders that we've spoken to talk about how IT is viewed simply as a department that fixes laptops and internet connections. How difficult is it to change the perception of what IT does within an organization? So first thing, you better make sure you can fix those laptops because that's what people remember about you. Is my computer working? It's like the lights going on. So we do that and we do it very well. And we also use the technology to drive how we service that. The other part of your question is really, you have to speak the language of the industry you're in. And for us, it's higher education, it's academic, and that's an important part. You have to understand it, and you have to collaborate with your peers as to what the solutions they need. We talked about earlier in the discussion uh, about big data. Well, we can help drive big data, but the goal of that is for the, the business leaders, the deans, the vice presidents, to utilize that big data to make decisions. But we have to be there with them and understand what they need from the data, what they need in their processes, what technologies do the classrooms need. And that's another major effort of our university. Both our president and our board of trustees puts a lot of emphasis that we have the tools that our students need to be successful. And when they leave, they can compete with every student out there. So you are starting to see a shift in perception. Whereas, yes, you are responsible for fixing those laptops and those connections, but the shift where IT is more strategic and not just tactical, you're starting to see that within the organization that people are starting to buy into that now? Yes, absolutely. Um, the good news with that is that many of the organizations on campus come to us when they have a need. And that's a really strong uh, connection. Mm -hmm. And so we work with a lot of different you know, we work with all the, the constituents on campus, but I think it's very important that they say, let's go to IT and see what they can do. We have some efforts coming up in, 
in our graduate programs and whatnot. And right now we're working with the vice provost of our graduate education as how the technology, how can he utilize the big data to drive where the programs, you know, what students to drive towards programs. How can he utilize the, the data to see where there's weaknesses and where there are strengths? You know, there are challenges every day, but it's really been outstanding with some of the programs that we've had the opportunity to drive. We, we receive a lot of support. I receive a lot of opportunity to, to work on these initiatives with our colleagues and where we can bring technology to the table uh, that will make a difference. You know, a number of years ago, and right now it's commonplace again, it was around 2007, we implemented a emergency text messaging system. And, you know, we looked at it, we had different discussions on campus, and we said that we wanted to have everybody registered. So not only did we get an emergency text messaging system, but we went into our administrative systems and asked everyone to register. And so we have regularly now on emergency text messaging over close to 20,000, which is our full population. And so when we have a snow day, you get a message, right. school will be closed. <laughs> Expectations, approaches, philosophies around the role of the CIO have also evolved over yeah. the years. Tell us more about that. Well, again, it starts with some of the stuff we've discussed that it's no longer a service organization it should be a strategic organization. Philosophies, I think it's important that my organization, the IT organization, which I'm very proud of, is able to bring to the table these solutions, some of the ones that we've already talked about. So that as we work together with the deans and the other administrators, we can make suggestions as to what technology can do and what it can't do. You know, and we're very realistic. But we also have the opportunity to help introduce new technologies. Again, just an example would be something like the emergency text messaging and things like that. You know, again, going back to our academic computing initiative for the laptops, uh, tremendous amount of collaboration. People all across the campus came together and said, this is what we want to do. And it was very successful. So our philosophy is not to dictate but to work together and bring to the table what's the best possible business solution. And sometimes you get the opportunity to come up with a unique solution. And we've tried to do that in many cases, and it's been successful. Tell us about some interesting trends that you're seeing when it comes to IT in business strategy in organizations. Well, again, we've mentioned a few of them, but obviously this, this whole data analytics is top of the list on everything right now. Big data, predictive data. We have master's programs in that at the university on data analytics. Um, we see the value. It can help drive you know, your services. We talked about it on the recruiting side. A big area of growth is going to be learner analytics. So using the data that you record regarding the students' programs, the students, the programs, modifying either programs or making recommendations for the students how to go about being successful within the programs. That is really growing significantly. And you're going to continue to see that. I think that'll become as commonplace as maybe spreadsheets someday. Another area that is generating enormous interest nationwide is obviously security. And as part of that, we are leading an effort as to how to improve the overall security profile. And one of the initiatives that I think is so important to do that is that the university has formed a committee of the senior most leaders in the university to address this issue, take on topics, make recommendations, agree on decisions, policies, and then we're all implementing them. That is just prominent right now, as you know, in every walk of life. You know, the expectations are, you know, my credit card, and then the next expectation is, who hacked my credit card? And we have the same issues in, in a university, and we're doing everything we can to address that issue and spending a lot of time on it. It's something that you have to be constantly on top of. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as you know, what's been in the news is some people subscribe to the theory, some people know that they've been hacked, 
and then the rest of the people don't know that they've been hacked. But we continue to monitor it. We put a lot of time into it. Uh, again, our board of trustees, our president, have that as a very high priority. What would you say are some of the most important characteristics and behaviors that are required to be a successful CIO? Well, I think probably the most important characteristic is passion. You have to really love it. And I think that's true in many uh, professions. But the more you have a drive for it, the better chance you have of, of succeeding. I think another important characteristic is you've got to want to provide the solution that's needed. And, you know, it's not like I, shying away, like I don't want to go to bat. You're the one who wants to go to bat and you don't want to want to bring the solution forward. I just think that's so important. Clearly the other characteristics of communications and also organization and technology knowledge and things like that are very important. But you've got to bring something else to it because, you know, that's what's going to distinguish how you're successful or not. And what behaviors and characteristics do you look for when you're hiring talent? Well, actually, I, I think that's a good question. Now, of course, again, you want to make sure they have the technology skill to do the job. But then you want to see that the person has the ability to communicate and collaborate with their teammates and with the people outside of the IT department. Because that's the value. That's where you're going to be doing your work. And that's such an important part. Will that person be able to communicate? Will that person be able to explain to the person in the administrative area or the dean's areas what they're doing, how it's working, and not confuse them with technical uh, language. How do you lead differently in times of crisis? Well, personally, I think it requires uh, a greater focus. I think you've got to just focus on the issue that's in front of you. I think it, organization is critical. Because in a time of crisis, everyone wants to run 100 miles an hour. And you've got to bring people together and make sure that everyone is going in the right direction and you know, working together, uh, not disparate pieces of information. So for me, number one, it's my focus, and two, it's to help drive the organization forward and bring them all together. As a leader in the industry, do you think that a skills gap exists in the technology sector? And if so, why? Well, I'd like to say it is not a skills gap. I'd like to say that the growth of technology needs has really taken off and that programs at the universities overall really emphasize technology. And that's why, as we were talking about before, St. John's has to keep up. You know, uh, it's really a, an important point of our president that if we're not keeping up with technology, we're going to fall behind. And so I think as far as the industry, the growth in the technology sector continues, even during all of the economic issues that we've had. It has been one of the growing sectors, obviously like healthcare and some others, but so we have to continue to have these programs that will provide the skills of the people that are graduating the colleges and then can go into these jobs because they're going to be expected to use some form of technology in that job, almost no matter what the job is. So what can schools and universities do to actually help bridge this gap? Well, I think the most important part is you have to make the technology available to the students, especially in their programs. And again, it's in two levels, the, fun, the foundation technologies, like your learning management system, and utilize that. But then it's also the technology that's specific to that program, whether it's business or science or mathematics what technologies are used in those programs. So like, we have a program called Homeland Security, and there's software that you know, really helps the students learn about all the different aspects of Homeland Security. And you have to make that available to them because they may use that program when they go out you know, into government or private industry or further their education. How can CIOs help bridge the skills gap within organizations? Obviously, training is an important part of that. You have to continuously help support your folks in their developing their skills, both technically and as leaders. So everyone has to have the opportunity to advance their skills, take on responsibilities, and continuously move forward, not only with the new technology, but as we talked about before, not just fixing the computers, but leading the technical solutions. 
And so our team is constantly working in these areas. What else can we do, both with our, our own leadership team in IT and then all of the people that work with us? Always got to be a step ahead. You have to be a step ahead. Um, but you also have to make sure you're helping them take the right steps. Because in a technology organization, it's easy to fall comfortable with the technology and not the business value. So you want to make sure you're bringing the business value from the technology and not just the technology, as they say, for technology's sake. What advice do you have for those people who are looking to start a career in the technology industry? Well, first I'd say to them, good choice. I think there's a lot of good opportunity. And with a good technology base, you could go into many industries in your career. So my advice would be, number one, go into the programs that you are most interested in, whether they're liberal arts or science or education or any of them. But make sure you're learning about the technologies that are incorporated in those fields and that you can go out and really take the lead. When you graduate, if you go into a certain type of business, whatever it is, you're going to be expected, whether it's the, the tools from, say, uh, spreadsheets or anything like that, or as I said before, you're going to be expected more to be able to analyze the data and use those tools that are doing the data analytics and then the tools that apply to the programs. You know, in our science programs, we have many technologies that connect to the science instruments, whether they're microscopes or others. And so they get the hands-on experience. And so you want to make sure you understand that the technology is going to be a part of your career, whether it's you know, in industry or in education. Have you had any mentors who've helped in shaping your decisions about career and life? Absolutely. I've been very lucky. First of all, as you know, uh, I graduated St. John's, as did my wife. And in our graduate program at the time, I had a very good um, mentor who was one of the program leaders who uh, really helped me understand to go forward. And I really appreciated that. Good man, very good man. And then in business, I've really been fortunate to have leaders that have given me the opportunity to work on different initiatives and be able to show what I can do. And I think that's so important. And really, when we say a, a mentor, I've been lucky. I can go across almost everyone I've worked with and say they've helped me do something else at each point. You know, and, and at one point, you know, stuff that we're talking about today, uh, I had leaders a number of years ago, I'll just put it that way, before St. John's, that emphasize that you're really there for the business. You're not there for just running these computers. And they made a big point about that. I'm very lucky. I'm, I'm very fortunate, I'd like to say. Mm -hmm. And so everyone could use some help in understanding what's beyond what I see. And, and you know, being a good mentor isn't to tell the person, well, you don't see it. Being a good mentor is to show them what's there and let them understand it and absorb it themselves, I think. Yeah. This was great, Joe. Thank oh, you thank so you. much thank for you. joining us today. And that's it for today. We'll see you next time on Sardar TV. I'm Vaishali Jain.